morning, everybody. It's nice to see that um, most people have made it back at this ungodly hour at 9.30 in the morning. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm wearing uh, various hats in my working life. I'm uh, uh, two days a week. I work as an assistant curator at Tully House Museum and Art Gallery Trust in Carlisle. And for two days, I work at the Fusilier Museum um, on uh, first, um, uh, well, well, one record, so it's totally different. And one day a week, I work as archives officer for Green Lane Archaeology. So I kind of, yeah, I kind of dip, dip in and out of um, of the archaeology museum world. And um, I enjoy all of the jobs, but um, this is probably the project that has taken up most of my time, and I probably enjoyed the most over um, over the past year. So it's. Uh, I'm talking for Tully House, but the whole project was actually a joint project, and we had five partners. Um, it's Tully House, Carlisle City Council, Wardle Armstrong Archaeology, um, and obviously we were funded by the, um, by the Heritage Lottery Fund, and, and the Carlisle Cricket Club, um, it was another partner, but more, they were the people who gave us the site, <laughs> who happened to own the site where we were excavating. So, it's... Um, yeah, it's a, it was a volunteer-based project, and there were several stages to it, and I'm hoping, I'm trying, to squeeze, well, I'm trying to squeeze all of this in 25 minutes, so if anything is unclear, or I'm kind of getting ahead of myself, um, find me afterwards or ask questions um, in the five minutes that we hopefully will have after this. So, basically it was an 18-month project that was um, based at Carlisle Cricket Club, which is um, in almost in the city of the, um, in the, in the center of the city of Carlisle, just north of the River Eden. And um, they, uh, Waddle Armstrong was, um, was asked to come out and do um, an evaluation, and they found, I think, not, not quite the Holy Grail, but <laughs> I suppose the Holy Grail of northern, northwest archaeology, they found a bathhouse. And in order to excavate it, we knew we would, they would, or they knew they would need a lot of manpower, a lot of help, and that's how um, this volunteer project came to be. And it's actually, um, it started off in 2017. Um, yeah, I'll just give you a little bit of background. If you want to know more, if you just Google an um, uncovering Roman Carlisle or Carlisle Roman bathhouse, there is a little bit of a write-up on the Waddle Wad Armstrong website, and it gives you the background. So it's literally, they put a trench on the side where Kala Cricket Club were wanting to um, build a new pavilion for um, functions and that sort of thing. <laughs> and they literally hit in the first trench hypocausts. So um, after a little bit more investigation, they realized Ooh, uh, what we have here is actually quite a substantial building. And with the hypocausts and everything, they, um, yeah, they figured very, very quickly that this is probably a bathhouse. Um, so in 2017, they had like um, a much smaller project where volunteers helped excavate um, a couple of trenches just to see what the layout was going to be. And Trolley House wasn't actually involved in this, except I remember very distinctly being invited to Ward Armstrong's new offices in Carlisle. And um, they were like, right, we'll show you now what we've so far discovered at the bathhouse. And I remember seeing <laughs> this room full of boxes of um, CBM. And um, I've actually, I can't remember, we had a small discussion yesterday about whether or not it's really useful to keep it or not. And um, I think I'm, I've got a foot in both camps here. I, I saw the CBM and I thought, oh my God, it's like the museum is going to be happy to have to receive all of this. But some of the CBM is actually quite exciting, some of the tiles. So it's like, yeah, keep it, yes, no. Mm. But anyway, this is not what the talk is about. I just remember seeing what this first project um, um, uh, got out of the ground, and it was already a lot. But they realized that there is a lot of scope to actually put together a, um, um, a professionally run archaeology project with input from the City Council and Kelly House Museum, which, because we are just across the road, and it's in our collecting area, obviously, we are the repository for whatever um, Ward Armstrong would find at the Bath House. So they... Um, um, we formed like a group and applied for um, um, lottery funding, and very happily we got it. So um, very happily we got it, 
And it's um, the whole project um, came um, as 18 months and came in different stages, where in the first stage, obviously, all the, um, the preparation for the excavation that happened last year would be done by Ward Armstrong and their staff. Um, and then we had, I think, almost two months, I think it was about one and a half months, five weeks or something like that, um, excavating the bathhouse. It's a huge site. It's, um, there were three trenches open, and basically we had, I think, about five members of staff from Ward Armstrong on site. Um, and 400 or so volunteers, it was, it was absolutely mad. We had um, a website where volunteers could sign up to help. So there were a couple of volunteers that already worked for Tully House and Ward Armstrong, and they were keen to help. But basically the whole thing was rolled out to anybody who was interested to come every day, to come for a week, to come just for a morning, to, um, to just basically work on a, um, on a site. Um, and for, this, for, for the project, it was very important to reach literally everybody. It wasn't meant to be just for people with prior archaeological knowledge or people know what they're doing or people who've worked in museums. It was very much geared to, um, to welcome everybody who just wanted to just sit in a trench for two hours and just see what it's like or um, maybe wash some finds or um, maybe sort some finds or just watch. It was we were trying to um, welcome everybody and try to tailor the work that was given out um, to their needs. So Wardle Armstrong was leading all the work that happened in the trenches and um, around the trenches and, um, and in the finds hut, whilst Tully House was invited to, um, to basically give um, uh, an engage, visitor engagement. Um, we had a finds handling um, activity. We, had, we were meant to have, I think we were meant to have a uh, scheduled lectures, but we pretty uh, quickly realized that that had to go out of the window because people, there was like a steady stream. When the excavation was taking place, we had a steady stream of visitors coming in. So anything that was scheduled didn't really work because we had, co we had people constantly from like nine o'clock until four o'clock. So um, Tully House had a tent um, right in the middle of the um, excavation area, and I'll show you lots of pictures. Later, yeah. So the, the whole project didn't have archaeology or um, Ward Armstrong or the Crick Club or, or Tully House in the, in the center. The, the community was in the center. And we were trying to basically have a project that was with the community, helping to excavate, but it was also for the community. So we were trying to bring people together who like make, make archaeology like the, the common denominator. You know, people with a love of history are just, um, obviously it was just after lockdown, so quite a few people said, oh, this is ideal. I haven't been out in months, or I've been isolating, but because the site was outside, and we were really lucky with the weather, except for the last week where it was torrential rain. And if you've ever sat in a torrential rain, water-drenched, filled trench, it's not nice. It is not nice, because... Some people have to shovel out water while others still excavate. But the volunteers were absolutely brilliant. They were so keen. And, um, yeah, we had, we had um, here you can see some of our happy volunteers excavating some of the walls of the bathhouse and the, um, the hypercost. And then we obviously, regular lunch breaks, very important. We had the cricket club, were very happy to have us. They've been absolutely brilliant throughout the entire project. And um, because the weather was so nice, we could sit outside on the grass. They were even playing cricket occasionally, so we could watch some cricket whilst having lunch. That was pretty nice. We, um, we had a finds hut on site, so volunteers were able to, um, to bring all the finds in, wash them, dry them, and help sort them. They basically learned about how archaeology actually works. It's not just to put a spade in the ground. You put a spade in the ground and start, um, and start digging. It's how you set out a trench, how you dig, how you dig a context, how, how you do everything. And um, it was, like I said, a really welcome project after lockdown. Several people said it was so nice to not only be able to help outside in the fresh air and they wouldn't have to worry about COVID, but we had a steady stream of visitors as well. So everybody, in the pictures, everybody 
that wears a high vis jacket, there are volunteers helping in the trenches, and everybody you see not wearing a high vis jacket, the ones in orange, that's Frank, who led the project on site. And um, everybody not wearing one, they are visitors, because we had lots of visitors coming in as well. Um, so we had, there weren't volunteers, but they just wanted to see what's going on. It's really close to the city centre, it's accessible. Um, we had people in wheelchairs who were able to come. It was a bit bumpy, it's got to be said, we don't need them, but it, 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 they did manage. Um, and Tully House were asked to be involved in the whole project basically as, um, yeah, as, uh, having, doing visitor engagement, basically helping um, visitors to understand what the hell it was we are digging up there. So we've put... Um, panels together. Vindolanda very kindly let us use one of the images of um, their reconstruction of their bathhouse. So I was able to, when I did the um, visitor engagement, I was able to explain, wow, well, we are digging a bathhouse and this is what it could have looked like. And this is where we have the hypercars and this is where we have the wet room and this is where we have the steam room. So people wouldn't just go on site and go, I can't see anything. They could actually, we were trying to give them an idea of what the house, the bathhouse would have looked like. Um, so, so yeah, it's um, we had so many volunteers signing up, and even whilst the project was on, people still said, oh, "Can I, can I come and help?" And um, everybody was super friendly on site. And normally, it wasn't an issue really having squeezing volunteers in and just giving them a trowel and sending them to a trench. So, God, you dig over there. So, here is a picture from the from the trolley house. Um, ten. You can't actually see me. I'm behind at this table where I've got science handling and um, um, some, some information for the visitors. But we've also had our education and learning department out and they um, brought things to do for children like making mosaics, making Roman coins, um, just for the little ones, just colouring in. Um, just in some ways if adults or if the parents were maybe more interested in um, and getting an idea of what the, you know, doing like the boring parent talk, we were trying to keep the kids engaged as well and tell them, look, we found one coins here, would you like to make one? So it was really a joint, um, a joint project. And um, I'm having come from the Portable Antiquity Scheme stock, I'm very much into small finds, so that's my thing. And I said, um, I said, we definitely have to have a handling collection because obviously all the stuff that comes out of the ground, we can't, even when it's washed, it needs to go through the whole machinery of commercial archaeology first. We can't just take the nice bits out and have them for handling. So and my line manager at Trolley House, Elsa Price, and I, um, we put together a handling collection of objects that are either very similar or could have been found um, at the, at, at the bathhouse. So we had um, things like pottery, um, a bead, brooches, things that people could just handle. So we wouldn't, you know, they wouldn't, they would go past the trenches and they would see in the, in the seed trays finds. And obviously they can't just pick them up, but um, people in the trenches could say, oh, well, if you want to see a, a wash thing, if you want to feel um, pot, Roman pottery, go and have a look in the trolley tent. So that's what, um, what we were providing. Um, we also had a couple of display cases with finds from the 2017 um, dig, and they were in the trolley tent as well, so people could see what had already been find, found. Again, it wasn't for handling, but it was for us to um, to show to people, to explain. We made um, you know, museum-style labels for um, for the objects, so um, that's like where the museum -y, museum -y aspect comes in. And throughout the excavation, you could kind of feel um, the museum -y aspect becoming stronger and stronger and stronger because part of the whole project was also, it wasn't only the excavation, but it was <laughs> putting it on display. And I think, I think I must have jokingly said about a million times, this is the quickest time, the quickest ever objects from an excavation went onto display ever. Like I've never seen things go on display that quickly. So um, we put the 2017 um, objects on display as well as um, some of the objects. I think it was about 30 or 40 objects that were found last year in August and September. So every, obviously everything had to be washed and we had we basically got everything not in boxes like normally museum get archives from, um, from a unit. It was literally 
we need these objects for the display and we got like a random box with no not sorted to according to material or whatever it's it's yeah it was very very immediate very very quick even the volunteers said that that's pretty amazing it's like we have we had about six months between the end of the excavation and um putting this display together and um it ran alongside Edges of Empire, which is um, both, ex uh, both exhibitions were celebrating Hadrian's Year, which we, which we have 2022, obviously. So we had um, Uncovering Rome and Carlisle. If you walk into Tully House's um, exhibition gallery, and on the left you had Uncovering Carlisle and uh, Roman Carlisle, and on the right hand side you had Edges of Empire, where um, slightly d different things were explored, but different finds. So they were very, they were very different exhibitions. And um, we, yeah, it's, um, I really, I, I mean, that's, I think that's why I came into my own. I really enjoyed putting the displays together. Um, we, we tried to find a thread that would pull all of these objects together because obviously when, when you're a museum curator and you have your, your archive from a certain site or you're trying, you have like a certain theme that you want to find, um, Want to find objects for you? Um, you have excavation reports or you know written stuff, research that you can that you can use. But obviously, we, we had nothing. We had a couple of bits and pieces. So we chose to concentrate on the volunteer stories rather than um, this is what the bathhouse would have looked like. This is the dry room. This is the wet room. This is what it would have been like. So we. We, we didn't concentrate on the, sto on the, on the history of the, of the bathhouse, but rather on the volunteer stories, on what, how, did they, how did the volunteers come to, to excavate, how, what did they think, how did they feel. So as you can see, in the, actually on the, um, on the other side, you can see it slightly better. We've got, we've got the, the entire layout of the exhibition was just like the trenches were laid out. And the... Um, this area here was where the hut would have been on site, so we wanted to give the, the visitors and the volunteers a feeling like as if they were walking on site. Um, again, we have on the, all around the exhibition, we've got um, snippets, pictures from the excavation and snippets, things that people said, um, little sound bites that resonated, I think, with, with us the most, what volunteers said, what the visitors said, so we were trying to connect the Roman bathhouse to us in the in the present, rather than saying, "This is yet another Roman bathhouse, and this is what we know about it." So we did um, we did choose objects that we we know had a story, like a volunteer story attached to them. Like, um, for example, the two finds on the left. I was actually there on the day when they, they were found by a volunteer um, wet sieving. He was processing samples. And he was like, oh, look at this. And he'd found several um, hairpins and part of a button lip fastener and a couple of, um, of seal matrices. And he was, he was well happy. And I think he got a, a sound bite in the exhibition with these finds that went on display. That little shape was found by one of the metal detectors. And this, this blue swell that everybody loved... <laughs> And we were hoping it would be Roman. It was everything was on display, and the exhibition was open when and um, somebody got back to us, and some researcher who who zapped it and said, oh, "Actually, it's post-medieval." But we still left it left it on the exhibition. We still left it on. So, like I said, research hadn't really been done on any of the objects because the time between it ex being excavated and going on display was so short. So, it's just one of those things. Yeah. So we had. Um, we put loads of pictures of the actual people finding things. We tried to find images of happy volunteers. And to be fair, we had so many, it was really difficult to choose because most of these people have had never excavated. They've never been, they've been maybe, maybe they've seen archaeology happening, but they've never actually been on site. And to see this joy, like somebody finding a pot or somebody um, metal detecting and finding a coin and the spoil heap. It was just like, I think I can't, having been an archaeologist for like 20 years, I, 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 find, it, I find it really difficult to replicate that. I'm like, yeah, um, yeah, I've seen like 2,000 Roman coins, so yeah, it's a, but in the exhibition we tried to basically bring the joy of, um, of, of, of the finders, of the volunteers, yeah, we, we tried to just express 
and their joy. So, <clears throat> like I said, the volunteer stories are all around in pictures, and we also have, as you, can, you can't read them, but it's like on the labels, and I actually might be able to, but I don't want to walk away from the mic, from the mic. but on the left-hand side, you can see we have museum-style labels for all of the objects, and um, we say what it is, what the date is, what it was used for, everything pretty straightforward, but we also collected um, volunteer impressions or excavator impressions and added them to the label, um, just to make it a bit more... Yeah, a bit more personal, and um, I think that went um, that went down very well um, with the visitors, especially people who may not have had the chance to excavate, but who visited the site as a as a normal normal visitor. And um, I thought we can take the whole volunteer involvement or the public involvement even further. Um, I do have time, so it's just a little anecdote. When I um, when we came out of lockdown last year. I am offered to help at my son's school with um, COVID testing. And when I arrived, they had this really cool Perspex, little Perspex stands for the, for the test tubes. And I, um, I remember saying to the, um, the organizer, oh, they're really cool. Can you buy them in bulk? Where, where did you get them from? And um, sorry, so, uh, being an objects person, I thought they were just really cool. And he was like, oh, no, 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 we make them. We've got our art and design department. We just knock them out by the, by the dozen. I'm like, really? That's really cool. And then um, I brought up in a, in a meeting for when we were putting these things on display, I said, well, why don't we get um, an arts and design class from, well, my son's at that school, so it was like I had kind of had the, um, the, the connection anyway. And I said, why don't we ask them if they would like to do a project to make mounts for our, um, for our objects? And I have to admit, you'll probably find it really funny. They had, I gave them all a brief. I worked really hard on this. I gave them a brief about the object, how heavy it is, how, um, how it should be supported, like, and obviously all of the, the mounts need to fit. It's like, it's like there's lots of things to consider that I'd actually never consider. If you go online and buy mounts in bulk, they all kind of look the same, especially if they come from the same place. They're automatically a group. But here you have like 20 individual people doing something for a degree so for, or for, for a course. So we had um, for my little, for our little blue swell, we had various exciting designs, mount designs that the, um, the student came back with. Um, and I have to admit, they look amazing, but my heart went a bit like, <laughs> when I saw the, the glass swell suspended in the air, I thought, maybe not. I think in, a, in some other world that might work, but in our world, I thought, no, we, we're going to go for the safe design. So every design I commented on, I put and posted like like little post-it notes on, on the PDF saying, yeah, I, I mean, I thought it was great. I didn't expect that they would give us like several designs to choose from, but I, I explained why I chose certain designs. So that's how we ended up with a, yeah, with a mound. So I think some are, yeah, I think some are, some, some are maybe unusual, others are really cool. Like, I've, um, and I know there's like a split, to, uh, like a, there's yeah, different opinions on that, but the upper left, I thought it was really cool. The, um, the girl who made the mount for our um, gaming pieces, apparently you can choose um, Perspex that has bubbles inside and Perspex that has no bubbles inside, and she chose the one with the bubbles because well, it's a bathhouse, duh. That's what she said to me, and I'm like, yeah, that's actually, that's right. So now I think it's really, it's really cool that we have, like, stands with bubbles in. I, I don't know, it's just like, I, to me, that was, that was really nice. Yeah, anyway, we, um, um, one other perk, like, something extracurricular we did, and the Liverpool, Liverpool University has a photogrammetry, well, in their department there was, um, they did photogrammetry with various museums um, in the Northwest, and we had Adan and Charlotte come up with their um, photogrammetry kit, and, the and we invited volunteers to come and do um, photogrammetry. And I'm not gonna, because I don't have the time really, I, I'm not gonna, I haven't got time to, um, to show you the, the finished product, but I tell you, they're amazing. If you go into Google, and you Google um, Tully House Museum and Art Gallery, um, Sketch Fab, and Uncovering Roman Carlyle, or something like that, you'll, you'll get to Sketch Fab, and all the models are there. And they're really, really cool. In the exhibition, we actually have the QR codes for the finds so that anybody walking around with a smartphone could just scan them and you would see the find on display 
but you can swivel it around and look like at the back because that's I, say, I think something in museums that we always have issues with we can't see something from like every side you have to have a certain um, you have to have a certain side you display but with the models obviously you can swivel them around yeah and now um, the last thing just to mention we then after the three or four months of Holly House we packed it all up and it was all transformed into a traveling exhibition which um, went to all of these um, venues in Carlisle district um, so the entire thing got packed up and moved around just to basically we're, like, bringing everything to the community people who might for whatever reason not, might not be able to come to Carlisle maybe haven't got I still maybe a bit a bit worried about Toby don't want to go to a big museum whatever the reason may be so um, we had various venues that agreed to to have the exhibition either the entire thing or just token objects or displays went out and uh, we are nearly nearly at the end now I can't believe it's like nearly done and dusted I think it's at the cricket club at the moment and um, then it's all done but um, yeah so it's yeah this is a uh, it was until, um, yeah, until a couple of weeks ago, it was at the Lane Shopping Centre, which is probably one of the more unusual, um, unusual places or venues to have um, an agricultural exhibition. But um, I know it was very well received. Like if you you go shopping and have a have a quick look at some some exciting, um, exciting agricultural artifacts. Yeah, it was a really it was a super project. This is my last slide, and um, I'm totally happy to. Um, Answer any questions, or if you if you want to know any more about the project, um, come and find me later or email me. Um, it's um, I would recommend. Um, I was saying that to some of my colleagues here. I, I I would recommend working with a unit because I think it's an eye opener. I kind of work in both camps, but I think there is a lot of um, preconceptions, and I think it does help to maybe understand what units are doing or what museums are doing because it seems. Yeah, I sometimes seem that um, they don't really understand what each other are doing. If you see what I mean. Yeah, anyway, thank you very much.